Good afternoon. I'm going to go ahead and start, even though it's not exactly 5 o'clock. Oh, it is now. Uh, my name is Coretta Patterson. I'm a veterinarian. And um, uh, the person that invited me had to slip off. So I'm going to just introduce myself briefly and tell you a little bit about myself. And then I'll go ahead and um, start with the talk. So I'm African American, in case anyone's wondering. I'm 100% 100% African American, whatever that means. Sorry. Um, and I am a veterinarian. I'm from Chicago. It's a small city a little west of here. Um, really west of here, actually. East, 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 east. Um, and I grew up in the city itself. So I'm from inner city Chicago. And I um, decided to be a veterinarian because I like science in school. And my father is from northern Alabama from a hobby farm. So his family grew, well, raised horses and pigs and chickens and cows um, and rabbits and guinea fowl. So I would spend my summers at my grandmother's farm, and I became interested in animals. And I was good at science in school, so it seemed like a good mix for me to become a veterinarian. I also have a mother who's a registered nurse, so she took care of humans, and I heard a lot about how unfun, ill humans were. So I was skewed away from human medicine and towards veterinary medicine because of the conglomeration of those things. So um, I've been asked today to talk to you all about um, diversity in veterinary medicine. And I'm going to talk about diversity in its totality. So we're not just talking about there should be more blacks and Latinos in veterinary medicine and Asian students, as there should be, and there should be more people that are comfortable about their sexual orientation. But also we're going to talk about the fact that um, Veterinary medicine is a fun profession that is a science-based profession. And yes, we take care of puppies and kittens, but it is diverse far, far beyond just taking care of puppies and kittens. So, and then we'll have time for questions at the end. So veterinary medicine is a fun and exciting science-based profession. Um, we take science courses just like they do in human medicine, like they do in nursing and podiatry school. And I want to make it clear that it is a science-based field. So yes, it is important that you have an interest in animals, but it isn't important that you um, have to love and want to fuzz on animals because not every, every veterinarian works with or very closely with animals on a daily basis. So we're going to talk about what that looks like and what other things there are that veterinarians can do. And there, OK. So of course, we all think of veterinarians as taking care of pets. And I bet most of you in here are pet owners because you're at the veterinary meeting and you're, how many pet owners do we have? Every single one. So um, there are, depending upon, there are lots and lots of surveys on how, what, how much pet ownership there is in this country. So we, their estimates vary, but there are about 70 million dogs in this country as pets. How many dog owners? I have a dog. And then there are um, about 82 approximately million cats. How many cat owners? Look at that. I couldn't find horse numbers. There are about 11 to 13 million bird owners. Any bird owners? So lots and lots of people own pets. So certainly when we think about veterinary medicine, we often think about that corner place where someone goes to get their vaccinations and where they go when they're hit by a car or things like that. So yes, that is a really important thing that we do. It's what I do um, because I love dogs and cats, but it isn't the only thing um, that the profession is made of. So. And I like, and as much as I'm not doing these things, these are the, the cooler things to me, the more important things. So veterinarians protect and monitor our food supply. So we have veterinarians that work for the Animal Plant Health and Sa Inspection Safety Service that make sure that the food that you get on your table is not contaminated. We have veterinarians in the military that make sure that all those people that we have in Iran and Iraq and all of those Middle Eastern countries that the food that they eat is not contaminated. So that is in my mind, and I'm a huge carnivore, I love meat, um, is a very important role for veterinary, of veterinarians that they protect the health um, of our meat in this country. At the slaughter plants, before food is, um, before animals are slaughtered, there's a veterinarian there taking a look at them. So yes, veterinarians can come, come become specialists and take care of animals in the same way that they can in human medicine. So I'm an internal medicine doctor. I take care of dogs and cats that have diabetes and kidney failure, or cats that are vomiting, or cats that are having diarrhea, or dogs that are vomiting, dogs that are having diarrhea. Um, they're getting too fat. They're getting too skinny. I like those kinds of things, so that's what I do. But there are other specialties. So if you wanted to do a specialty medicine type thing, you can still do that in veterinary medicine. We have surgeons, those that work on bones those that work on soft tissue. We have neurologists. They work with the brain and the spinal cord and the muscles and the nerves. 
Um, we have cardiologists that work on the heart. Um, we have behaviorists that specialize in animals with behavior issues. Um, anesthesiologists, um, a very valuable group in my mind because they make animals go to sleep for us and recover them so that we can do procedures on them to get to the diagnosis of problems they're having. And there are emergency doctors that will see patients on an emergent basis. Dermatologists treat skin. There are equine medical doctors that treat horses with medical problems. And there are equine surgeons that treat horses with surgical problems. There are food animal doctors that take care of horses, goats, llamas, alpacas, sheep. Um, I don't know that they see very many chickens, but there are poultry medicine doctors as well. And those guys will also take care of pigs. There are zoo and wildlife doctors who maintain the animals in the zoo collections. And, and just as a sidebar, the zoos exist primarily for conservation purposes. So we're trying to make sure that the species of animals that are endangered, that we can preserve that species and that when their habitat is encroached upon, that we don't eliminate that species because we're encroaching on their habitat. So zoos, while they're cool to go to to look at animals, they have a far bigger, more important role that they play for society. Um, and actually, uh, zoo and wildlife veterinarians, that's a really difficult job to get because um, people tend to want to be those and there aren't that many of that position available. Um, we have veterinary radiologists. They do MRI and CT scans um, on the different species of animals, and they do x-rays and ultrasounds. And that's cool because um, as a specialist, I get, they get to help me diagnose things. And they also get to pair at um, large research universities like this one with other researchers. Um, so one of our uh, radiologists was doing a, special, uh, a study on turkeys. So they were actually doing CT scans on turkeys, believe it or not. Um, as a part of a research project. So there are lots of opportunities for collaboration, collaboration with other science-based specialists when you're at a um, specialty hospital, at a teaching, at a veterinary school. And then um, we have oncologists, so they treat cancer. There are medical oncologists that actually give chemotherapy to patients, surgical oncologists who do surgery on these patients, and radiation oncologists actually do radiation to treat the cancer on these patients. So those are just, uh, quick review of the specialties that exist within the profession. And those are primarily on at teaching hospitals or at specialty hospitals in the country. Veterinarians protect human health. There are lots and lots of diseases that start from the animal population and move to humans, or they start to humans and they move to animals and then they can move back to humans, and that's a concern. So one of those diseases is um, Lyme disease, where we know that that organism that causes Lyme disease can start with a mouse that is infected, and the tick can bite the mouse, and then the mouse can actually, um, the tick can come from the mouse to a human, and then back to another human. So we can actually transmit diseases like Lyme disease because of uh, human-animal interaction. And I don't know if many of you all follow the news, you might not because you're in college, but just recently there was a nurse in Spain who was um, recently in Africa helping with Ebola victims, and she returned to Spain, and she's in quarantine now because they're worried about her potentially having Ebola virus. But what I'm more interested in is that she had a pet dog, and the Spanish government was sort of wondering, well, does this dog have Ebola? Can the dog get Ebola? What can happen with Ebola? And their decision was to euthanize the dog. Um, so the internal medicine group, we have a, a thing called a listserv, and we have these communications amongst ourselves about, well, did we think that was the right thing to do? And just because dogs have been shown experimentally to mount an infection, can dogs actually have the disease? And so that's why it's really important at the intersection of human health and animal health that veterinarians are there involved in the discussions to say, well, let's talk about an actual infection, and can this animal actually transmit disease to a human, and was that really the right thing to do? And obviously it was in Spain, the US government doesn't have a lot to say about that, but I think that as we have these case, more and more of these cases, that discussion is going to come up again, and it's going to be vitally important that veterinarians are involved in it. So yes, puppies and kittens, cool, but this is real life stuff. This is really important, deep science level types of things that veterinarians need to be at the intersection involved with. So how else are veterinarians involved in um, human health care? Every drug, has anyone here ever taken any kind of medicine? Anything, Tylenol, Motrin, anything? Those drugs, any drug that's going to be marketed for humans in the United States has to be approved by the Food and Drug Administration. Drugs that are going to be approved by the Food and Drug Administration have to go through at least one animal model 
typically like a rat or a mouse, and then a second animal model, either a dog or a primate, before they go into human clinical trials. So every drug that you or I have taken has gone through a series of studies with um, some very bright people working on them and some very selfless animals being used in those studies so that we can better human health. So veterinarians participate in those studies because sometimes they are the actual researchers working on the pharmacologic research or else they are a laboratory animal veterinarian overseeing the health of those animals to make sure that the researcher who may not understand everything about that animal um, appreciates when the animals are sick or when something isn't going well with them. Um, I was, for many years, interested in being a laboratory animal veterinarian um, when I was in veterinary school. And one of the cooler things that I learned is um, there's a species of monkey called a stump-tailed macaque. And they're kind of, they look like old men. They, they're not. They're kind of short and have a little pot belly and they're bald. And they were um, using them in a clinical trial for a drug, and the drug was going to be used um, to reduce blood pressure because there are a lot of people that have hypertension, in particular people that look like me. Um, so they were using these primates, giving them the drug, and looking at the effect that it would have on their blood pressure. What's really interesting is this particular species of monkey has a bald head, and what the investigators noticed is as they were giving them this medication for blood pressure, their hair started to grow. So these primates who are normally bald started sprouting hair. That drug is Rogaine. Has anybody ever seen commercials for Rogaine where you spray it and it makes your hair grow? So the company said, hold the phone. It's a decent anti-hypertensive. It does a pretty good job of lowering blood pressure. It's great at growing hair. And there are so many balding men in America, we can make more money off of that. So that was a really cool thing that happened just as veterinarians are observing and saying, hey, these monkeys are getting hairier. So I think, again, really interesting thing that happens at the intersection of human and animal medicine. Um, we also help to discover new animal models for disease, and this is where the National Institutes for Health are very interested in things that veterinarians are doing. Um, when there is a disease that occurs in people naturally, but when one of us can find an animal model that has a disease that's very similar to that, and most animals have a shorter lifespan, not true for primates or birds or turtles, but most animals have a shorter lifespan than humans. If we have the opportunity to study that disease in a species with a shorter lifespan, we may be able to make inroads in helping that disease in humans. Um, oh, and then we talked about the drugs. So there are lots and lots of jobs that veterinarians can have uh, working for the federal government, again, for the betterment of human health. The government, actually, there are many government agencies that employ veterinarians. So the FDA is the Food and Drug Administration. The CDC are the Centers for Disease Control. And that's sort of the cool, sexy one in my mind, because those are the people that get sent in when there are outbreaks. Um, then we talked about Animal Plant Health Inspection Service. The Food Safety Inspection Service is FSIS. The USDA is the United States Department of Agriculture. So again, they're participating in making sure that our food is safe. And then NIH is the National Institutes of Health. Um, so I was looking up the data to find out like how many veterinarians are there employed by the federal government in, in all of these. And there are a little fewer than 5,000 jobs. But that isn't to say that there aren't more opportunities for veterinarians. But in all of these agencies, there are only about 5,000 veterinarians currently doing the work. And there is room for more. And in particular, as we see, again, more diseases happening in one part of the world. And because of travel, people coming to another part of the world, it's not just important that we know how that disease progresses in humans, but how the animals in the human's environment are, interact around that disease. And veterinarians are going to be vitally important in sorting that out. This is a list of zoonotic diseases. So zoonotic diseases are diseases that go from an animal to a person, and it's called an anthropozoonosis if it goes from a person to an animal. These are diseases that can cause illness in people that we have reason to be concerned about. So the, as, the point of this slide is that there's lots and lots of work for us as veterinarians um, to help better people, human health. Hopefully, we will be involved in helping to find cures for diseases. The woman on the right is studying something called sudden acquired immunodeficiency. That is the disease known to affect horses, humans, and dogs. She's found it naturally occurring in dogs. And so what she does now is she reproduces those dogs. She breeds them, and she takes the puppies. And she's trying to figure out ways to reverse the disease in newborn puppies. And we'll hopefully translate that into what can we do when newborn humans are born with sudden com combined immunodeficiency and potentially move that on to horses as well. So 
veterinary medicine, again, intersecting with human medicine and using animal models to hopefully better human health. That's Dr. Kathy Meeks at Michigan State University. So hopefully I have convinced you that veterinary medicine is interesting. It's not just puppies and kittens. There are all these other things that you can do. It's a really diverse and interesting profession. Um, what are the backgrounds of some of the current veterinarians now? We're going to talk about what is required for you to enter into veterinary medicine. What should you do to make yourself a good candidate um, to be attractive to veterinary schools? So we'll talk about the numbers. The population of the U.S. is about 316 million or so ish. 13% um, of that population is comprised of African Americans. 17% of that number is Hispanic. 5% of that number is comprised of Asians. 1% Native and American Indians. And 2% are two or more races. So huge uh, spread of people across this country. Different kinds of people. But when we look at veterinary medicine, currently there are about 105, and the, the number varies. The Bureau of Labor and Statistics says somewhere around 95,000. I got this number from the American Veterinary Medical Association, that there are 105,521 positions held by veterinarians in this country. Um, about 64,000 of them are in private practice, 15,000 or so are in public and corporate sectors, and then 23,000 are unknown. I'm not sure what unknown means. The uh, Atlantic Monthly did an article on veterinary medicine in November of 2013, and I thought this was really interesting because they outlined the um, whitest professions in America, and veterinary medicine is at the very top of the list with 96.5% of the prof profession is comprised of Caucasians. Um, when we talk about the data that I just shared, what percentage of this country is Hispanic, what percentage of this country is Asian, what percentage of this country is African American, um, there's no good reason, there's no good explanation in my mind for why um, this profession would not reflect the, the demographics of the country. And we'll talk about why that might be. Um, the Latino population in the U.S. grew 58% in the last decade and has surpassed African Americans um, so that there are more Latino uh, people in this country than there are African Americans at this time. GLBT, transgender, queer questioning people in the U.S. are estimated to number between 13 and 17 million. So we have to, we as a profession have to look at what can we do to, to make these numbers better? What can we do to attract people and to create an environment within veterinary medicine where everyone is A, interested in the profession because they understand what the opportunities are and also where they're comfortable and um, they don't have to experience um, isolationism because of, the, because of being the only one at one or more institutions. So I wanted to talk about this. Uh, this is also an article from the New York Times from August of this year where they uh, featured Dr. Garza. He's a veterinarian practicing in Texas and he's a graduate of Texas A&M University. He was the only um, person of uh, Latin descent in his class when he graduated. And in 2010, the last time Texas looked at the data, there were 84 Hispanic veterinarians in Texas. Um, but there were 5,728 his veterinarians in the state. So 5,728 veterinarians, only 84 were uh, Hispanic, and the population of the state is 38% Hispanic. So for the population of veterinarians to reflect the population of, uh, uh, of the state, they would need to have 2,174 vets, but yet they had 87. So there's a problem here. What can we do as veterinary institutions to attract students of diverse backgrounds, and to say there are other things that you can do. Um, we know a couple of things from human medicine, and we talk, and I've talked about this a lot. Why is it that students of color may not come to the field? Um, as I said, I have a, nurse, a mother who was a registered nurse who sort of discouraged me, but when it came down to uh, actually going to medical, to veterinary school versus medical school, what I heard from my mother, and I think this is common. Um, in particular for Hispanic students and African American students and Asian students actually, for the family to say, why wouldn't you go to be a real doctor, right? Why wouldn't you go and be a physician or a DO? Why do you want to mess with animals? Um, my own grandfather said to me the summer before I started vet school, if you just go to human medical school, I'll pay for everything and you won't have to take any loans out. 
well, I hadn't taken the MCAT. There were so many other factors involved, but just the fact that someone thought, well, you could just change, like you can just go to a human medical school, and, and it's just people don't understand. I, I do want to circle back to a comment that I heard in the previous session. Um, some students think, well, I want to be a veterinarian because I don't like working with people. Anybody secretly want to admit that? I want to, I want to go because I don't like working with people? then you probably should go into human medicine because we work with people all the time in veterinary medicine. Every animal that we treat is attached to a human. Even if you're a lab animal veterinarian, those laboratory animals are owned by whoever does the study on them or they're owned by the pharmaceutical company. The horses have owners, the cows have owners, the dogs and cats have owners. Every animal that a veterinarian interacts with has a person attached to it. And so there's some psychological, emotional attachment to that animal, whether it's just financial or it's emotional. So we are in a profession where you get to not work with humans. Um, interestingly, this profession is overwhelmingly filled with introverts. I have never, and I'm not an introvert, you might have guessed that. I've never been able to figure out what the attraction is that, that we have these introverted people because you're interacting with people on a daily basis. But so we're overwhelmingly introvert, we're overwhelmingly Caucasian, and we overwhelmingly are people that love animals, sometimes at the expense of loving humans. So I want to encourage you to, to do community service and to do things that will get you out there interacting with more people because there isn't a veterinarian that, that doesn't interact with people. There are some that don't like it, but there aren't any that don't interact with people. Um, so what we know from human medicine when we've asked the question, why, why is it that um, the human medicine, AAMC, AAMC in particular, has done a lot of work looking at what is it that minorities want when they go to, a, to the doctor? Well, minorities want to feel that they're culturally understood, that they aren't being judged. They want to feel a connection with their doctor, and they want to feel comfortable, and they actually have increased levels of satisfaction when the doctor shares their cultural background. And so we, in veterinary medicine, are presuming that the same is true for our clients, that they want to see someone that they connect with culturally and that they feel comfortable with, that they don't feel that they're being judged and that they'll have increased satisfaction. So it's possible that one of the reasons that the numbers are low is because we don't have enough actual veterinarians for people to feel that comfort and to interact. And then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because when I was in admissions at a, a college of veterinary medicine, we heard so often from young students um, particularly Caucasian students, that the first time that they wanted to, they knew that they wanted to be a veterinarian was when they took their pet, their horse, their dog, their cat, their fish to their veterinarian and they watched that person care for their animal and they saved the animal and that sparked an interest. Well, if you, if your family isn't going to a veterinarian for whatever reason, you lose an opportunity to have that spark formed. And, and that then causes an issue where the students think about something else and then they go to what I call the dark side and they go into human medicine. So, <laughs> so um, veterinary schools are now looking at a way to try and um, spark interest in younger kids and then facilitate them having more experiences with veterinarians so that perhaps those students will go on to want to grow up and to become veterinarians. But we are still in our infancy in doing that and we are gonna end up having to borrow a lot from human medicine. So I want you to leave here knowing that there are many, many different things that you can do as a veterinarian. And it's not just that as a veterinarian, you take care of puppies and kittens. So hopefully you have an appreciation for, I know I, I speak fast, but lots and lots of different things that veterinarians do. But I also want to make the case for why is it important for there to be veterinarians in all walks of life, for all different sizes, colors, skin colors, sexual orientations within the profession. So because our population d dynamics are changing in this country so substantially, the people that enjoy minority stat majority status here will, in the next 15 years, be become a minority. So it's going to be very important, again, that we have veterinarians that represent a number of veterinarians that represent the population dynamic, the population of the country in a demographic way, so that there are lots and lots of Hispanic, African American, Latin, LGBT, so that everyone can see someone that represents them and that they're comfortable going to see them and seek care. So we are drawing the same conclusion that we think that we need to have people that are com comfortable um, with their sexual orientation being something that they don't have to hide or disclose in the profession. So we want to have people comfortable whether they're LGBT or straight, whatever. Um, so the question that 
is often asked is why aren't more diverse students drawn to veterinary medicine? So again, I talked about the question of lack of exposure. If you don't take your pets to see a veterinarian, then you're more less likely to have that experience where, oh, this was something I want to do. Um, Lisa Greenhill and Anton Asser did a really interesting study in the uh, New York area a few years back. It was in the late 90s where they um, actually surveyed children in a high school in the Bronx area. And what we found is, what they found is that young kids, really usually around seventh grade or so, kids have an interest in veterinary medicine. And that's a really great time to, to um, commit to a profession. And that's a great time to start getting volunteer hours in. But if nothing happens, if you don't have any animal exposure, if nothing happens to further your interest or to um, give you any more information, you're likely to change to something else. And they were able to show that with this group of kids that they looked at, that they tended not to own pets, they tended not to have veterinary care, and they ended up switching on to something else later on in their high school career because they just didn't have that interesting little flame. That interest of flame was never fanned, so they never actually pursued veterinary medicine. Um, uh, culturally, again, um, families have a tendency with underrepresented minorities to discourage it. So why would you do that? And I think that that's something we're going to see even more now because of the difference between um, tuition for veterinary school is very similar for tuition for medical school, but the salaries are not the same. So I think students are going to need to arm themselves with a conversation with the families. Yes, the salaries aren't the same, but there are these other things that I can do. There are these other areas of interest that I have. If I work in an underserved area, the government will cover my loans. If I work at a university or for a federal program or a nonprofit for 10 years, my loan repayment program will be forgiven. So there are other things that students need to be aware of um, to combat the family and that argument of, I don't want you to be a veterinarian. I don't want you to be an animal doctor. I want you to be a real doctor. Um, and so we need to look at young kids, figure out a way to um, get them interested, and then keep them interested, maintain that interest, in addition to addressing these other issues. When I talked about the, um, the numbers, the, the number of people that there are in veterinary medicine and how many there are in the country, but there are also still lots of opportunities. So I want to talk to you a little bit about what do you need to do to be a good applicant for veterinary school because you've seen sort of the wide array of things that you can do as a veterinarian. So currently, as, as of last night, there were 30 um, veterinary schools in this country. Um, so I want to talk just a little bit about how many of you all have heard it's harder to get in vet school than it is medical school. Has anybody ever heard? Right. So I'm a veterinarian. I'm married to an MD. I want to believe that because I want to believe that I'm smarter than him. And I am smarter than him. But here's the truth of the matter. There are 30 vet schools in this country. And right now, each student, we see uh, about four, four to 6,000 applicants a year. The average student apply, applies to 4.2 schools per, per, per application cycle. The comparison for human medicine is there are 130 just MD schools in this country. So we have 30 DVM schools plus one VMD, and then 130 MD schools plus another 35 DO schools. So they have a far larger number of schools. So there are, when we talk about seats available, there are many, many, many thousands of seats available in medical schools in this country, more than there are seats available in veterinary school. So when we talk about a fun, I like to think of it as a funnel. The funnel for veterinary school is about this big, and yet there are only this many seats, but the funnel for human medicine is this big. So there are far more opportunities to be admitted to medical school. So it's harder to get in vet school because we have fewer seats, but I don't know that it's harder to get in because we are smarter, although in my heart of hearts, I want to believe that. So that's the sort of rationale for this sort of, this idea that it's harder to get in. There, there are just fewer opportunities to be admitted into veterinary school in this country. Um, what we know about the data, and I got this data from AAVMC, which I'll cite later, is um, the average student, as I said, is applying to about four schools. Um, at each, at each application cycle, that a degree is not required to be admitted into veterinary school as it is in human medicine. So to go to human medical school, you have to have a bachelor's degree. Our veterinary students don't have to have one, but only 10% per admitted class don't have one. Most of them do have one, and many of them have not only a bachelor's degree, but a master's degree, and a little less than 1% of them have a PhD. So, and every couple of years, Michigan State graduates one who was an MD who saw the light and came over to the cooler profession. So um, there, I just want you to be clear, most likely you'll end up getting a, um, 
a bachelor's degree and you may need another year or so beyond that to, as you con contemplate admission in veterinary school. Um, the average grade point average for the class entering in 2014 was 3.59. So that's pretty high. And so that average means that it was 3.59 across those 28, 30 schools. So there's some schools where it's a little higher than that and not that many schools where it's a little lower than that. So that's a pretty high um, grade point average. And, but that's about comparable with um, what it takes to get into human medical school. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about the majors that applicants choose, because for years I've heard students say, well, I should major in animal science, or I should major in biochemistry, or I should major in, and so I'm speaking from my experience, um, and I will ask Yasmin to comment on this when I come for questions, but I would tell students, as long as you meet the prerequisites and you do well in those prerequisites to major in something that you will be successful in. So if you're a great English student, I would say be an English major, take the science classes that are required for the 4.2 schools that you're gonna to apply to, take a little more science so that you're a better student when you hit 20 credits in a semester, your first year of vet school, but don't let your major be chosen purely by, well, I have to go to vet school. So as I said, I'm from urban Chicago. I'm an animal science major because 100 years ago when I vet, went to vet school, I was competing with people from farms. So I knew that I needed to handle horses and cattle and pigs, so I chose this major. But as I reflect now at 45, I think, what if I hadn't ever gotten in? What on earth would I have done with a bachelor's degree in animal science knowing that I wanted to go back to a city? Uh, so think very, choose your majors carefully. Don't just major in biology because you think that you should be a biology major. Major in something that you're interested in, that you can be successful at, but also make sure that you do well in the prerequisites. And then as again, just a little bit more science because it is a very science intense um, major. But I don't think that that schools necessarily give you extra credit for being a biochemistry major versus if you're, especially if you got a C in it, it unless if compared to an English major who had A's in them. Does that make sense? So choose your majors carefully and based on your ability to be successful, not just on what you think the admissions committee wants to see. Um, almost all the schools want you to have animal experience. They want to have you have that experience be either volunteer or paid. And there are a couple reasons for this. Um, Veterinary medicine is, is not as glamorous when you're actually a veterinarian as it appears to people that want to be a veterinarian. And so I guess I'm a boarded internist, which I guess there's not a bunch of us. There are only 2,500 boarded internists in this country. I still pick poop up off the floor. My husband is a human internist. He doesn't do that. He doesn't give, he doesn't take temperatures. He doesn't, there are a lot of things that he doesn't do because he's a human internist that I do do when I am a veterinary internist. So I think the experience piece is really important for students because we want you to know what you're getting into. We want you to know that no matter how far down the road you get, if there is an animal that relieves itself as a veterinarian, we're always going to have to clean some of that up. And that's different from other health professions. And it doesn't bother me. So we want to make sure that you know that and that it doesn't bother you. And I always tell people that it's good luck if something poops on you. So we want you to have, and we want you to have as much variety of animal experience as possible. So I knew when I started vet school that I did not want to be a general practitioner. So I worked in lab animal and I took care of rabbits and I took care of mice and I worked with pigs because I wanted to have the best possible application. So I want you guys to think about if you love horses and you know that you want to work with horses, well spend a little bit of time doing horse work, but then volunteer at a shelter so you get that small animal experience, um, get a job, the work study programs are great. You can change the cages of rats and mice so that you have a variety of experience because almost all of the um, admissions committees want to see that you have a variety of animal experiences and not that you are you know, the number one dressage rider in the country, but that you understand horses, you understand cows, you understand rats, you understand mice. So vary your experience as much as possible through both work and volunteer experiences. Almost all schools um, want you to have good grades. And uh, there are some schools now that once you send your application in and your, your grades make a certain point, they discard your grades and never look at them again and they invite you to an interview. And if you do well on in the interview, you're admitted. So you have to have good grades to be admitted into veterinary school, but they aren't the end all be all because it could be that you have great grades, but you have a horrible interview and you, you aren't admitted. So um, don't just, 
try to have good grades, but, but realize that there are other aspects that they care about in your admissions process. Many of the schools are now doing something called the multiple mini interview. I think there are about seven schools doing those. And those interviews, they do them at Davis. Those interviews are geared to um, assess your interpersonal skills, your um, integrity, your morals, and those aren't things that you can practice. You, so it's a really cool type of interview, in my opinion. Um, most vet schools want someone who's done community service. So yes, it's nice if you've done, uh, worked at the shelter and helped the animals. I think most places will be very excited to see that not only did you help animals, but maybe that you worked at Habitat or did something at a food shelter that you've actually interacted with humans. And um, some schools give you credit for being a resident of that particular state. So again, because there are only 30 schools and there are um, 50 states. There are obviously some people that are from states that don't have schools and um, there are contracts with some of the schools for some of the states. Oh, I wanted to show some of the AAVMC data. So these are um, enrolled first year students by state residency, and this is from 2014, and this is again from the American Association of Veterinary Medical Colleges. And this sort of parallels the blue school, the blue represents states that actually have veterinary schools. Oh, you gonna fix that? Okay, can you do that? La, 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 la. So you should just stay here because I'm going to come back in a minute. So when it comes up, you'll see that the blue, the blue lines represent states that have veterinary schools and the orange lines will be states that don't have veterinary schools. And it's interesting to me because the highest, the state that has the highest number of applicants was California. There, yay, yay, made it, okay. All right, so um, these are American students only that were reported by the American Association of Veterinary Medical Colleges. So look at the, the schools that have, the states that have schools in the blue, and then that one lone orange one is New Jersey who doesn't have one, but they contract with a couple of other places. So. Um, but even with 264 students applying to veterinary school in California, Davis has, what, 160 seats, and I'm not sure how many seats Western has, probably like 120, and they're not just taking students from California. So there is a need for students in California to have to go to other schools because Davis doesn't just take people from California, and neither does Western. There are, Texas takes very few, they only take 10 students, I think, from outside of Texas, so their class is essentially all Texans, and Georgia takes like five or 10 out of Georgia, so, but most schools um, take a fair smattering of students outside of their state. I, can I stay here? Oh, you want to oh no, yeah, I want to stay here. Okay, sorry. Yeah. So the other thing that has happened that's been very interesting in veterinary medicine, and academics have discussed this and have tried to figure this out, and no one can, is if you look at this graph, in 1970, this profession was 89% male and only about 11% female. And what has happened over the ensuing time frame is that the population of males entering the profession has dropped precipitously to the point that 20.4% of the population is male in 2014, and the female numbers have gone up to the point that 80% of the population is female in 2014. Over that same time frame, women started to work more in this country, so they were no longer staying at home. And we know that in mechanical engineering, other forms of engineering, women have gone up. In human medicine, women have gone up, but in no profession has it happened as dramatically as it has in veterinary medicine. And we don't really have an explanation for it. We're not exactly sure why it's happened, but um, it is overwhelmingly now um, fe feminine and less masculine. Although when you look at the working population, the men are still working. So there's still a lot of male veterinarians working out there, but as the population ages, there'll be fewer elderly male veterinarians and more females. Okay, how do I go to the next one? One more down. One more. One, yep. Thank you. 
So this is the presence of racially and ethnically underrepresented students at US Colleges of Veterinary Medicine. So the one school that has the highest number of diverse population is Tuskegee University. It's um, the only veterinary school at a historically black college in Tuskegee, Alabama. So about 76% of their class tends to be racially and ethnically diverse. And then after that is um, Western College of Health Sciences in, where is it, Pomona? Pomona. And then there's UC Davis coming. And I think that is appropriate because if you look at the population of the state, I think that those numbers make sense. Um, but then there's a precipitous drop as you go down. Um, and what I don't have is a specific number, so I can't tell you exactly how many students of each racial uh, breakdown are present in each one of the schools currently. We have had that in some years. Okay. Oh, this one is just the graph of the GPA of the incoming students and how it's changed over time. And this is something, unfortunately, that's happening in America, in my opinion, in college in general. So you see the grade point average going up and up and up and up. And it came off just a little bit. What's the difference between 3.6 and 3.59? That's ridiculous. But the point is, is that we have sub, sub, such substantial grade inflation that the pressure on you guys is just overwhelming to, to do well. And I, I don't know what to say about that. It just makes me sad. Um, and the last slide that I wanted to show you from this was just the applicants by sex. And you'll see that the male applicants have pretty much hung pretty much the same between 17 and 20 percent from 2009 until 2014. And the females have stayed about the same between 76 and 80 percent. So that is how we got that other graph. And again, can't explain it in veterinary medicine compared to other medical fields. And it's not just that I can't explain it, it cannot be explained. We don't know what, what has happened. Okay, now I want to go back to, yeah, oh no. Yeah, go back down to the slide that you were on. 24. 24 okay. okay, thank you. Okay, so as we talked about, some states will, will give you preference based on residency if you're from a state that doesn't have a veterinary school and your state contracts with the state. So as an example, I live in Nevada, and Nevada doesn't currently have a veterinary school, so Nevada students can come to UC Davis, they can go to Washington State um, as a part of an agreement that, and Colorado State, that um, exists between those, uh, between those states. Okay, well, so hopefully we have covered the diversity of veterinary medicine, what types of things you can do as a veterinarian that aren't just taking care of puppies and kittens, although that is fun, um, and what the numbers are currently at the veterinary schools in the United States and um, what you need to do to be a successful applicant. And I'm happy to entertain any questions. Yes, yes. in your personal statement, so should you say, as a African-American female, I've experienced, yes. I think that, I think that, um, so for the schools that have supplemental applications, they're going to, they'll get to that with the supplemental application, but I think it is important to say, I wouldn't just say it, but I would say it in the context of how it's informed you as an individual. And I think in my essay, I said something about, um, in my physics class in undergrad, when we had to choose partners, everyone partnered up and there was me and like the skater chick because she was the only person who was willing to work with me. So I talked about how that informed my experience in my physics class in undergrad, that kind of thing. So not woe is me, poor me, nobody liked me, but so I got stronger because of that. Yes, ma'am. So um, I'm, as you, I'm not shy, and I'm, I'm, fair, I'm rather outspoken. So I, I, dealt, I, was, I graduated from University of Illinois in 1995, and um, I, when my class started, there was myself, um, a woman of Indian descent and a woman of uh, Hispanic descent in my class. Um, the, Hispanic, the woman of Hispanic descent subsequently withdrew from the program. And, and I did have comments 
um, that were oftentimes shrouded as jokes um, from my classmates or um, questions that might have been borderline inappropriate. Um, and at the time, they would make me very, very angry. But what I found, and I, so I ended up, I've done a lot of different things, and I stayed at a university for 14 years, and I think that those experiences really informed me as a human. And I, and I had to tell myself that when someone says to me, can I touch your hair, in most instances, in the, right, I'm, I see your face, but I don't think that they, they didn't mean it in, a, in the really horrible way that you and I thought. They meant I've never been close enough to an African-American woman to be comfortable to ask them this, and I feel somewhat comfortable with you. Can I touch your hair? So, of course, when they asked me, my reaction was yours, and I was like, nah, you get this. But, but now, at this point in my life, I'm, I realized that that was a window for me to, um, to teach someone um, something about my culture. And in fact, I remember one of my classmates said, I don't think of you as black, I just think of you as Coretta, you're just a person. And I said to her, but you know what? The food that I eat, the clothes that I wear, the church that I go to, the music that I listen to, all of those things are informed by my being an African American. So when you say you don't think of me as that, you're taking something from me because it makes it easier for you to interact with me. And that's not fair because I am all of those things. So I need you to interact with me on that basis and not just I think of you as this sanitized Coretta because that's not who I am. I, I was named for Martin Luther King. Like, if I were a boy, I would have been Martin Luther. So it's really important to me. I, I celebrate my culture and my heritage, and it's important. It's an important part of my life. So we can be friends, but you can't say, well, you're just not black, because I am. But there were many times in vet school where I had to say to someone, it's probably not appropriate to say. Or even as an administrator at a vet school, I had one of my favorite Latina students said to me that one of her classmates made a really inappropriate comment, and, and we had to unpack that. So there are often opportunities for you to, to learn and to grow, and, and sometimes you get mad, but sometimes you have to take those as opportunities for growth. But I, I don't think that I've ever been stopped from doing something that I wanted to do because I was a woman of color in this profession. And in fact, I think that especially when I was an undergrad, I think that when things came up because I was an animal science major, the deans were sort of like, go get that black kid. So I think that there were opportunities that were given to me because I was this kind of loud, upfront person of color that they knew wanted to be a veterinarian. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely not. No, I don't think it's any easier to be accepted, and I, and I don't think it's any easier to get through. I, so, no, I, I'm unaware of a school that is, at, I, I was the associate dean at Michigan State until June, and I wanted to give opportunities to all students, and I certainly would like to have our student population reflect that population of American society, but I wasn't able to say, well, I just want to pull this person in because they're of color. So, I don't think that there are any any programs that sort of necessarily incentivize your admission based upon race. I could be wrong, but I'm unaware of that. And it certainly, um, I think that every school, once you get in, you got to fight just like everybody else. It's, it's a lot of information. It's a lot of material at all 30 of them. Nobody can change dog anatomy. It's still a lot. Any other questions? All right, thank you.